Glad to see all of you here this morning. It's delighted that you decided to join us today. If this is your first time, we ask that on your seat, before maybe you sat on it, I don't know, but we have a connection card. If you fill this out, even if you've been coming for a while, we would still ask you to fill this out because this is a way for us to be able to let you know of any upcoming events or any announcements in the past when we had a really bad monsoon and we got kind of washed out here. We had to change locations quickly and that's how we can let you know what's going on. And if this is your first time and you fill out a communication card and take it to the next steps table, we have a gift for you. So bonus, right? Also just wanted to say that we want to thank all of you for continuing to give to Aspire Church, even though we, you're already spending a lot of other money on Christmas and all the other good stuff. But if you brought your offering today, we have a basket at the back table back here. You can put your offering envelope in. Or you can go online to our website. We have a, a portal there you can give. Or you can text Aspire Church, all one word, Aspire Church to 77977. Speaking about Christmas, I don't know how many of you have, it's quite clicked yet, but you have like a week. One week. So if you haven't finished your shopping yet, <laughs> just a warning, go ahead and get your shopping done. You got, you got a week, right? Next Sunday is Christmas Eve, and we have, we have two services going on, on on Christmas Eve. We have our normal 1030 service, but we also have a candlelight service later in the evening. It's a completely different service, different message, different songs. We're going to have hot chocolate instead of the coffee, because no one wants to drink coffee that late at night, right? But we encourage you to come to both, if you're able to. If not, at least come to one of those. And also on your seat, we have some of these little invite cards. So there's two of them, one for you, one for a friend, coworker, neighbor, mailman, whoever. We encourage you to invite someone to come to the, the service with you next Sunday. Also wanted to just let you know that this week we are in our third week of Advent and the theme is peace. It's kind of crazy with all the chaos going on out there with Christmas and everything, that, but we, we're called to, to live in peace to have peace with reign within us. And today we're going to have Pastor Glenn Elliott. He's going to come and he's going to share the message with us this morning. For those of you who don't know who Glenn is, he was the pastor at Pantano Christian Church for 24 years. And currently he spends most of his time uh, kind of mentoring, leading, and teaching and, and equipping other leaders and pastors. He spends a lot of his time going around. He's been to lots of, lots of countries, the the Soviet Union, Ukraine, Kosovo, Cuba. He travels all over and kind of helps churches get planted and helps them build up their team and everything. I've also told that he, he speaks Russian. Da? Yeah, that's about the only word I know. But yeah, so if, if you have any questions about how to speak Russian, you can always ask him. Um, he, we're, we're, again, we're delighted that he's with us. He, his wife, Jolene, is not here with him this morning, but he, his wife of... Jolene, they've been married for 44 years. That's impressive. Amen. So he's, he's going to go ahead and share with us after we continue worshiping. And when he comes up, I just want to ask all of you to just give him a really warm Aspire Church welcome when he comes up, all right? Amen. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, so grateful to be here. Uh, I want you to know that your pastor, Brian, is sacrificing for Jesus. He's at a 49ers game today. Yes! That's so awesome. Uh, Brian and I are good friends. I am so grateful for Brian, not only for uh, starting this church, but for uh, the work that he does in our city, helping other church planters. And uh, uh, grateful to be friends and grateful to be here. Glad to let him be able to go have a fun day at the 49ers game. I actually hope the 49ers win for his sake. Sorry, all you Arizona fans, but... Uh, have you ever read a passage uh, or a text or a story in the Bible and, and you just wondered, how can this be relevant to me right now where I'm at? And, uh, and, and I'm not asking that question to cause any doubt about the relevancy of the Bible. It, it's just an honest, fair question. Um, I, I love what uh, Pastor Andy Stanley said years ago. He said, all scripture is equally inspired but all scripture is equally applicable or relevant to every stage of life. 
you know, you read the story of Judas and he went and killed himself. You go, what's the, what's the connection here? You know, you get some, not everything relates to where we're at right in a given moment. So uh, Brian asked if I would preach today and I, and I was look, and he gave us a text because we've been looking at the Christmas story out of um, Luke chapter 1. And, uh, and we're looking at this old couple in the story. And when I first started this, studying this passage, I was going, wow. I'm not sure w- what this says to me. Now, not that I, I mean I'm old, but it, it, I just couldn't quite yet n- immediately figure out what the story had, had related to me. And, and it's really important for me when I preach that it's got to be relevant to me so that I can help make it relevant uh, for you. But the longer I meditated on this passage, I, I began to see some spiritual principles emerge. And, and so let's get into the story. It's the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah who were old. They were past their childbearing age. And... Uh, Anyone want to guess how old maybe uh, they, they were? Any idea? Any guess? 45. That's that, that could be pretty close. Uh, we, we don't know for sure. My guess is around 50. Um, and, and the only reason that is because he was a priest, and in the Old Testament it said priests had to retire about age 50. So we figured maybe he was around there. Maybe he could have been a little older. Who knows? Uh, but, uh, but we know that Elizabeth was past childbearing age. And this couple, amazing couple, they loved God. They walked the talk. Their faith was real in every way. Uh, they're a picture, I think they're a picture of a couple who have aged really, really well. And, uh, and I picture them as the kind of, of folks that you'd love to have as your grandparents. You know, these are the kinds of people that would be awesome. And, but all their lives, they longed for a child. They prayed, they waited but the pregnancy never happens. And, you know, every couple knows the pain of wishing that they could have a child and weren't able to or having lost a pre-born child. And in that culture and in that time, for a woman to be barren, it was a symbol of shame. In fact, women were devalued who were unable to have uh, uh, children. It robbed them of value. And and so they were experiencing the pain of that, the disappointment, the shame. And now in their old age, They'd lost hope. They'd given up. Wasn't going to happen. And so at the beginning of chapter 1 of Luke, we learn that an angel comes uh, to Zechariah and tells him he's going to have a child. And, and uh, he's to be called John. And, uh, but Zechariah, being as old as he is, and he knows the situation that he and his wife are facing, he wants proof or confirmation of this. And uh, I don't know if you can imagine this scene, but, but here it is, the, the angel. We know that it happens to be the angel Gabriel. This otherworldly creature uh, with unfathomable glory from the throne of God comes to Zechariah, and this is so overwhelming that Zechariah is gripped with fear. And in the midst of that, he has the audacity to say, can you give me some proof? What more proof do you need than this, this incredible angel that's just told him he's going to have a, a child? And what's interesting to me is that this man who was, it, it, we, the Bible says he's righteous, he, he was good, he had an incredible faith, but he allowed this unbelief about this child and not having a child to take root in his heart. And folks, that's true for you and I as well. We can know God, we can love God, we can have genuine faith, but there can be pieces in our lives where that root of unbelief can also be at the same time. And so the angel Gabriel said that because Zechariah had uh, doubted and questioned God that he wouldn't be able to speak until his son was born. Uh, So he was uh, silent for nine months, nine months of complete silence. Some of you who are married and your wives are going, that would be pretty awesome, you know, uh, total silence. Uh, now, the angel was clearly sent by God uh, th- because the thing that Zechariah thought was impossible actually happens. Uh, we, we know that Elizabeth uh, is pregnant. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up the story in Luke chapter 1, verse 57. So uh, if you need a Bible, there's Bibles on the side. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take that with you. I'll open your, your device, your phone, uh, to Luke chapter 1, uh, 57. And we're going to start at verse 57. Luke chapter 1, 
Verse 57. Now, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy on her, and they rejoiced with her. This was a big deal. A miracle happened. This childless couple of their old age, they have a baby. God was so, so good and kind to them. And it's clear that something special is going on because everybody's celebrating that. And, th- and that leads in to the next step, uh, which was natural in, in that day and in that culture. Verse 59, uh, Luke 1, verse 59. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives are called by that name. And so this is a little bit shocking to the, to the extended family and friends because, uh, uh, you know, this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Now, again, Zechariah and Elizabeth, these were righteous people. They were following the law and the traditions. They brought their son to be circumcised. And a part of the tradition of that was also to name the child. And the tradition, not only the circumcision, but the naming of the child was that you would always name him after one of the parents or at least a grandparent or somebody in the immediate family. And there was no John in the immediate family. So everybody's confused as to what, what, what's going on here. You know, he should have been named Zechariah Jr., right? That, that's just the way it should have been. And, uh, and, and I, I don't want us to just pass by this, but in the Jewish culture, these traditions are so strong and powerful that, that, that Zechariah and, and Elizabeth have to be feeling the pressure to conform uh, to what was normal at that time. And, and so they're, they're, the, the, the family, the, the, the community is so confused that they, they want to hear directly uh, from John, who's been silent for, for nine months. And so we pick that up in verse uh, 62. And they made signs to the father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. As I was reflecting on this this story, I, I, I thought, what happened to Zechariah during that nine months of silence? It's a long time. What was happening, you know, inside it? Had his faith grown? What had God been, been, been saying to him? What, what, you know, what was he learning during that time? You know, what was he reflecting on in his situation with his encounter uh, with this angel from God? And, and then watching his wife's pregnancy happen and, and a miracle occurred, you know, what happened in that? What, what, what was transformed in John during that time? And I think this, I think he went from one who trusted in his own sense of time. I mean, he knew that they were too old to have a baby. That's why he questioned the angel. But he came to trust in a God who's bigger than time. He went from one who trusted in in a sense of their circumstances. He was so aware of their circumstances. They'd been childless for a very long time to one who trusted in a God who's way bigger than their circumstances. You know, if, if we just read this story casually, it, it seems as if maybe God, through the angel, was punishing Zechariah. He, he questioned God, you know, what, you know really, give, give me some proof that, this, that I'm, you know, we're really going to have a child. And, and, and then he's silent for nine months. And, and, and our natural bent is to say he was punished for that lack of faith. But I don't know that that was the, actually the case, that it was punishment. Um, was it punishment or was it something else? Was it, was it God's way of growing Zechariah's faith even deeper, in a deeper way? You know, there's a difference between punishment and discipline. And way too often when God is disciplining us, we interpret it as punishment. And, and, and what I mean by this is punishment uses fear to stop bad behavior. And those of us who are parents, you know, we know how easy that is. You know, we want to put the fear of God in them, you know, to stop doing whatever they're doing. But discipline works in a much different way. It comes out of a place of love where we try to teach a person new behaviors, new attitudes, new ways of responding or reacting. We want to build a better character. And I believe that God wasn't punishing Zechariah, but was actually deepening his faith. And so during that nine months of silence, 
I think this is what Zechariah learned. This is what God was speaking to him and how he was challenging him. And he was just saying, look, I have a purpose that's bigger than, than your age or your history. I'm doing something and I'm going to allow it to happen. I'm going to make it happen. And, and, you know, Zechariah, though, he had a sense of how this is how things go. You know, we're old, it's over, it's done, it's never going to happen. Realism, folks, we are so, you know, the, the reality of any situation is so powerful in our lives. Now, we shouldn't ignore reality. That's not the point. But, but we have to not be limited by what is realistic always in our lives. And so here's, here's how I see the story uh, that, that's really a part of the Christmas story. Here's how I see it as being relevant. It's never too late for God to use you to write a new story. It's never too late for God to use you to write a better story. Yeah, the couple was old, unable to have children, but... Think about it. So was Abraham and Sarah, 100 years old, and yet God gave them the promised child. And then there's Hannah. She prayed for years and years and years for a child, and then finally God answered her, and she became the mother of the prophet Samuel. And, and, and uh, both uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they knew those stories very, very, very well. They knew them by heart. But we tend to get fixated on the circumstances of our lives. We assume, we assume things won't change. Realism rules. For example, and this is one of my experiences, your child's not living by faith or they're making really bad decisions. And it just feels like it's never going to get better. Or you gave up hope that your marriage would be what you'd always dreamed it would be. Or you've given up on yourself. You're struggling with an addiction to porn or alcohol or whatever and you don't see yourself getting free or you, you've lived all your life with depression or anger and you wonder when, when, how, can it ever change? Maybe you're new in faith, but your past was so bad, you go, man, I, I feel so disqualified. That past just is so strong. And you have all of these regrets. But it's never too late for God to use us to write a new story, to write a better story. You know, it's really easy to take whatever's happening as permanent. <laughs> It's easy to let go of hope. We, we settle for the, this idea that things can't change. Circumstances can't change. People won't change. I can't change. Now, there's a phrase I learned um, from a parent who, and, and this phrase has been so helpful for me. Uh, I'll share the phrase and I'll give you the context. And, and, and the sentence was this. Don't take temporary for permanent. And I heard this when uh, my daughter was in high school and she got involved with drugs. And we got her into a recovery program, but she would relapse time after time after time. It seemed to drag out forever. And at one of those points where I'd lost hope, this parent said to me, don't take temporary for permanent. As long as someone's still alive, including ourselves, there's hope there's hope. If we just look at the realistic situation, we lose hope. And, and that's why just, just being realistic is so dangerous because it can rob us of hope. Hope dies when, when, when our trust and our confidence in God dies. Hope dies when we lose the true sense of who God is. God is God. And there's no situation, there's no one that's beyond the reach of God. That doesn't guarantee that everything will work out just as we want. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that as long as God is alive and he will always be alive, there will always be hope. It's never too late. You know, Zechariah had all the rational reasons to think it was impossible for them to have a child. It all made sense. But his mistake was in thinking that his situation was permanent. It's never too late for God to use you to write a new story or a better story. 
So, let's re-engage the story. We pick it back up at Luke chapter 1, verse 65. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So now everybody gets to see this miracle. They see the goodness and kindness of God. And, and, and word spreads. God is up to something. Hey, God has been quiet, silent for 400 years. The last prophet to speak was the prophet Malachi. That was 400 years ago. And the people have been subjugated by different nations during that time. They've suffered. They've wondered what's going on. And all of a sudden, now that Zechariah can speak, he tells them the story that an angel came, that he tells them that God is doing something big and huge, and the word is spreading, and everybody is really excited. And they're asking, what kind of child could this be? Is this the Messiah? Is this another prophet? I think there's a, that's a great question, but I think there's even a better question. And that better question is, what's God up to? And I think that's a question that we need to ask every day. God, what are you up to today? Well, because he is alive and active. And, and, and he wants to continue to, to work in our lives to write a, a, a new story, a better story. And, and we need to ask that, be attentive and ask that question, God, what are you up to? What's going on? How are you at work in and around me? And so after nine months, Zechariah can finally tell everybody what, what's happened. And then what happens is Zechariah moves from being a priest to a prophet. He tells what God is up to. And he tells us in what is a Hebrew poem or a psalm, a song. And, uh, and, and this song, by the way, is, is actually now has a name. It's called the Benedictus. Benedictus is a Latin word for blessed because the very first word of the song that, uh, that Zechariah declares is, is the word blessed. And, uh, and it's 13 verses long. And we find it, it begins in, in Luke chapter 1 starting at verse uh, 67. And the father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies, that, that, that from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. What Zechariah is saying in this part of that, that poem, that song, is that God hasn't forgotten us. It's been, there's been no prophecy for 400 years, but he has not forgotten us. He's remembered us. And he's faithful. He's faithful to all the promises he made. And then he continues in, in verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Wow. What... what what Zechariah has done there is he's given us the gospel, the good news. God has provided a Savior who will offer us the forgiveness of sins, all our sins forgiven. Our selfish, sinful desires and actions are forgiven out of this deep love that he has for us. He's wild about us. He's crazy in love with us. 
and he's sending a Savior to remind us that he has that depth of his love that he has for us and that no matter how dark things get, no matter how, how it seems, there's a morning star that's coming to shine in our lives. As we live in this darkness, there's always going to be a sunrise. And that's the Christmas story. That, that God has come here to help us. And the last thing that, that Zechariah says is that this Savior will lead us to a place of peace. And God is our only path to peace. You know, Jesus said it this way. He says, he says look, the peace that I leave with you, it's not as the world understands it. It's much more profound and deep. The peace that Jesus offers us isn't about our circumstances. It's not about the absence of conflict or struggle. It's the peace that we have with God in the midst of our struggle. That's profound. And that's what the Savior came to do was it ha- allow us to have that relationship with Jesus where there's this incredible peace that we need and we desire. This is the good news. This is the story of Christmas. Jesus came as our Savior to forgive us, to reconcile us to God, to have peace with God, that we would know what that peace is all about. God knew that we needed this story, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And I think, think there's another reason why, and that's that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they lived in tension just as we live in tension. That tension is between faith and reality. They, they don't go well together. And we, and we constantly live in that, ten, in that tension. Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, they were old, they had no children. God seemed to have been absent and silent for a long, long time. Things were not going well for them or the people of Israel. At that time, they were, they were under Roman uh, uh, domination. And yet, at the same time, they had faith. They were really good people. We live in that tension between faith and reality. The tension won't go away. We, we wish it would. We, we like everything to be clean and, and, and clear and black and white and resolved and wrapped up nice and easily. We, we think that peace in life is life without tension. But, but God actually loves us too much to remove that tension. You see, it's in the tension that we learn that God is greater than our circumstance. It's in that tension that we learn that God is bigger than our shortcomings. And we never learn that kind of faith when everything's going smooth, when everything's copacetic, when when there's smooth sailing and life's trouble-free. That's why the scripture says that we live by faith, not by sight. And while God doesn't promise to take away the tension, he does promise to guide us and lead us and help us in the tension. He helps us manage the tension, not remove it. He helps us experience peace even in the tension. So doubt and realism are always going to be with us. Uh, We face challenges in us and those around us and those we love. But in those challenges, we can choose to believe in a God who's bigger than our circumstances. It's never too late for God to use you to write a new story, a better story. You know, I've come to appreciate this story like never before, so I'm grateful that that our friend asked me to to, to do this one. When he first asked me, I go, this is a tough passage. But you know what? Here's what I came to appreciate about this. Zechariah and Elizabeth, even in their old age, were still growing. They still had things to learn. We know from the scripture they were righteous, blameless. Folks, there's only a few people in the Bible that are called blameless. I mean, that means living a really good life. So they had a real faith. And they were, you know, most of us probably would have looked and said, they've arrived, 
you know, in that way. And yet, there were still things that God wanted to do in their lives. Even in, even if we've been following Jesus just a very short time or a long time, God isn't done with us. He wants to keep growing us. He wants to deepen our faith. He wants us to be able to experience even more the depth of his love because we'll never fully, even fully grasp it in this life. It's never too late for God to use you to write a new story, a better story. I'm 68 years old. Um, I, so I'm, I'm probably at least uh, the age of Zechariah, maybe a little older. I've been following Jesus for 53 years. I've been a pastor for 46 years. And you'd think that by this point in my life, I'd have it pretty well figured out. I mean, that's a long time. Come on. The God who loves me more than I can fully know isn't done with me. He still wants to use me to write a better story. It seems late in life to be learning what God has been teaching me right now. Um, I'm on a journey. I'm still a learner. God loves me enough not to punish me, but to discipline me, to show me some new things. He wants to deepen my faith. He wants to grow my, my ability to know and to love him. And it's never too late to go deeper with God. You know, here's how God's been writing a, a better story in my life right now. It's been over the last six months. You know, we all have wounds from our childhood. Now, some of us, when you hear that, go, oh, I don't want to hear that psycho babble. The fact is we all have wounds from our childhood. You can ignore it, you can deny it, but it's reality. Not all of us. But for 67 years, I could never identify any childhood wounds. I was totally unaware. And it's only been in the last six months that I've come to realize that my parents... They, they didn't engage with me at, at, at an emotional level. In, in my family, there was no touch. Uh, there was no intimacy. Um, I don't ever remember either of my parents saying that they loved me. Now, as a kid, I didn't particularly doubt it, but I never heard those words. There was no emotional connection. Now, in our family, life was safe, but it was sterile. My parents were good people. Um, and I could, I could describe that in a lot of ways. They protected me. They provided for me. There were no gross sins in our family that I'm ever aware of, but I lived in emotional neglect. It took me 67 years to figure that out. But that was just the start. And then in that journey, you figure out how that affects your relationship with God, how that reflects, affects your relationships with, with, in my marriage, with my kids, and on and on and on. You know, early in life we learn strategies to manage our, our hurts, our, um, our hardships, our trauma. And here was my strategy. I just figured this out six months ago. It was to be stoic. That's how I deal with emotional pain, which basically was I wasn't going to deal with emotional pain. That's, what's, that's what it is when you're stoic. Um, you just move on. My life motto that I didn't figure out until six months ago was, it is what it is. When something bad happens, I've been a pastor for 46 years. Do you think I've ever been hurt as a pastor? Thousands of times. You know how I handle it? Move on. It is what it is. Make the best of what it is. You manage it. You got to be bigger than the pain. And it seemed to work well because I've been pretty well respected. And by not getting stuck in the pain, I've been able to accomplish a lot of stuff. But in this new journey, Jesus has invited me to sit with him in my pain. I've not done that before. Now, if some of you, that you do this really well and you're thinking, man, you are really slow. Yes. I am. 
Did I know that I should do that? Probably. But I didn't understand it. I'm learning to sit with Jesus. That's what the word abide means in the Bible. Abide in me. To remain with me, to sit with him. That, 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 that's what it means. And so for the first time, and this is embarrassing to admit, I'm, I'm discovering how much Jesus loves me. In a way deeper way. It's incredible. And, and here's how I experience God now. God fully knows me. He fully knows me. And he fully loves me. That's good news. So that's what I'm focusing on now, learning to feel with Jesus, learning to sit in my current pain and difficulty and struggle. Now that's my story. My story's not yours. Yours is different. I'm just sharing with you that the, the, to me the beauty of the story that we're looking at here is that God is never done with us. Whatever your story is, he is alive, he is present, he is incredibly interested in you, every little detail. He's wild about you, and he wants to engage with you. What does God want most? I missed it for a lot of years. Here's how I lived my life as a, as a follower of Jesus for 53 years. I have done everything I can to obey him. That's good. I have taken godly principles and, and, and actually implemented them in my life. That's good. I have done a ton of stuff for God. I'm not bragging. I'm just, it's just honest. I've done a lot for God. That's good. But that's not what God wants most. That is not what God wants most. What he wants most to be with us and us with him. And that's what Christmas is all about. The angel came to Joseph in a dream and said that he would, his wife would bear our Savior. And he was to be Emmanuel. We sang about it. God with us. What God wants most is to be with us and us with him. That's it. It's not complicated. It's not about what Zechariah and Elizabeth had to live under, 613 laws that they had to constantly follow. The good news, the gospel is, he's with us and he invites us to be with him. And that's what Zechariah got to experience as well. So don't take temporary for permanent. God's not done with you. He's not done with me. Because he loves us too much. And just like Zechariah, most of us are going to learn those deep lessons when we're quiet. <laughs> when we quit speaking, and we shut our mouth, and we slow down our life, so that we can experience the depth of how much he loves us. And it's only when we're silent that we can really experience the guidance that he has that leads us to the peace that he wants to give us. We stay too busy. We try to maintain control of our lives. We allow all kinds of things to distract us from hearing God. Zechariah had a gift, nine months of silence. He didn't have a choice in that. We have to choose that. And so that's my challenge as I finish. I just want to encourage you to make time to be quiet. To slow down, even in a Christmas season. And really be present with Jesus. Let him speak to you. Hear his guidance, not telling him what you think you want to do, but allowing him to speak into you and to begin to experience the depth of his love for you. It's never too late.
for God to use you to write a new and better story. Let's pray. God, thank you for having this story recorded for us in your holy scripture. Thank you for the reminders that what you desire is to continually, until the time that we leave this planet, you want to continually be at work in our lives. So God, I'm asking your Holy Spirit to speak to each of us individually and and help us to figure out how we're going to slow down, to be quiet, to just sit with you, just hang out with you, to abide with you. And we know that you promise that if we do that, you will be there and you will not disappoint. And we look forward to that. In Jesus' name, amen.